Good afternoon, everybody. Hope you are well. Um, it's two o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, everybody's at home, hopefully, uh, per the governor's executive order. And um, what better time than to have a webinar scheduled, right, Jen? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, so on your screen, you'll notice we have a couple links. We have the handouts uh, for today, as well as um, the survey uh, for the end of the program today. And I will also put those in the chat box a couple of times throughout the, the day, just so you can have a quick link um, and access those. If you have any difficulties, let me know. Um, and a reminder, a quick reminder, that this Thursday we're doing a live virtual meeting uh, about virtual programming. Um, moving forward in these uncertain times, we're just going to be brainstorming. I don't have answers necessarily, um, but I want to hear from all of you and to talk about, you know, the bigger picture as well as uh, next steps forward, including summer reading. So. Yeah. We're going to chat about that this Thursday at 2 p.m. I've sent links out to Mish Libel and the My Youth Listserv, but your, my email is on the screen. You're welcome to contact me at any time. So without further ado, thanks to the Institute of Museum and Library Services, we have Jennifer here for our last um, of this year's uh, series of best story, uh, story time practices. Um, and we're going beyond story time today with the care and feeding of teens at our library. So Jen, I'm going to stop my share here and let you get started. Thank you. All right. So welcome everyone. Thanks for coming to this webinar today in such strange times, but it is kind of nice to be in our living rooms and be able to share um, some information today. So I hope you're doing all right. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I have been feeling both hopeful, strangely hopeful about um, where this might lead us and changes that will come from this really strange time and also a little scared um, and a little of, of the uncertainty, but trying to take things each day and do my best to stay engaged with work. Um, so I'm happy to be here with you and Kathy, I thank you for the opportunity for um, providing these webinars this year and also the last two years that we've worked together on these. It's been really wonderful. So um, in honor of one, the theme today, the care and feeding of teenagers, and also these times that we are in, I would like to start with a story that I hope gives you all a little bit of hope and um, the knowledge that what we do does make a difference. Okay? So many years ago, I lived in Hastings, Michigan, and that's downstate in the southwest corner of Michigan, just north of Kalamazoo. I lived out in the country, and I'm a runner, and every Sunday morning, I would take off for a very long run on these beautiful, rolly dirt roads of Barry County. Well, I had a neighbor across the street, very eccentric, older woman who lived alone, except for the 12 to 15 goats that she had on her farm. Her name was Agnes, but we called her the goat lady. And uh, she was indeed eccentric, uh, very independent and, and very different in her ways. So every Sunday morning, I would do the same route on the run and I would pass the pond on the back part of her property, the pond that sat on her property. And every Sunday morning for the longest time, I would see Agnes sitting down by the edge of the pond. Now, I didn't think much about it, because she did some strange things. But one Sunday, I was running and cooling down on the road, and I thought I would go over and just see what she was doing. And as I got closer to her, she was crouched on the edge of the pond, and she had a trap. And when I got closer to that trap, I realized that there were three or four turtles walking around safely inside. They weren't hurt inside the trap. And then I got a little closer, and I said, hello, Agnes. And I looked down and saw that she had one of those turtles in her lap. And she had a scrubber, like a kitchen scrubby, in her hand. And she was scrubbing all the algae off of the back of that turtle. I said, Agnes, what are you doing? She said, oh, I'm just scrubbing the algae off of all the turtles that I can catch. I said, why would you do such a thing? She said, well, you know, with the algae on their backs, you know, it makes it hard for them to swim. They don't absorb enough heat from the sun when there's algae, and it can deteriorate their shells. So I just help them off, help them out by scrubbing off the algae. And I thought, what an amazing thing to be doing on a Sunday morning. 
And I said, Agnes, you know, every pond in this county probably has thousands of turtles, freshwater turtles. Don't they always live with algae on their back? And she said, yeah, isn't it a sad thing? And I said, so on how many Sunday mornings, how many turtles have you helped? She said, oh, I don't keep count. And I said, well, you really think that you're going to make a difference out of all the turtles that are out there in Michigan? You're going to scrub the algae off a few of the backs of the turtles that live in your pond? And she picked up the one that she was working on and scrubbed off just the last bits of algae before she put it back in the water. And she looked up at me and she said, if this little guy could speak, he would tell you that my scrubbing the algae off of his back made a huge difference in his life. And she put him back in the water. Now I thought about that. I thought about that as such an amazing thing because she was a really incredible woman. She has since passed away, which is kind of sad. Um, but I thought about that, you know, and I thought about the times we're in and those of us who work with teenagers know that they need a little bit of special care, right? And we might not be able to connect with all of them. And you might wish that more teenagers are coming into your library to engage with all the wonderful programs that you provide. But if we can connect with just a few of them, and we can give them an easier way to travel in this world, a little bit of a lighter feeling, an easier way to navigate and feel the warmth come through just a little bit more than we have done our job. And I think that's true also in the times that we're in right now. It's really hard to know what to do. And it's really hard to know how to comfort each other. But if we can just help one other person understand that things are going to be okay, by listening, by sharing a little bit of time, even if it is virtually, and, and by reaching out to those who might need us a little bit more right now than usual, then we're gonna make a difference to those people. So I hope that story helps. Um, I've been spending a lot of time in these Zoom rooms. I don't know about you. So um, all of my storytelling gigs were canceled. None of them are live any longer. In fact, there's very few that have gone virtual because no one's in school and no one's in the libraries. So I've lost a lot of gigs and hopes that the people that had hired me for all of March and April will rebook those gigs because this is how we make our living. Um, when I'm not here, I work, uh, when I'm not on the road or I'm not doing the storytelling work, I am a success coach at the community college here in Traverse City. And so all of our very freaked out students have been meeting with coaches in Zoom rooms like this. So it's getting to be a pretty familiar format. Um, I wanna start also today by telling you how and when I fell in love with teenagers. And if you're here and you're a youth librarian who works with young adults, then you may share um, my love of teenagers. They're one of my favorite audiences and my favorite groups of people to be with. And so um, I want to take you on a little bit of a journey to let you know how this work began for me. Um, so years ago, before I had this business as a storyteller and a narrative consultant, my first career was teaching sixth graders in an environmental education center, the Battle Creek Outdoor Education Center. And all of our sixth graders came out to the center to be a part of an adventure program where we put them up on ropes courses and climbing walls and out on camping trips where they had to rely on each other. And that was my first experience with teenagers and um, we had to live with them 24 hours a day you know, the whole time that they were there, oftentimes doing dorm duty and sleeping in the dorms with them, eating three meals a day. And we got very close in a week's time and started to understand a little bit about them. But it was when I went into the classroom and taught sixth graders for the Ionia Public Schools that I truly fell in love with middle schoolers. So I want to tell you a little story about my last group of students. So the last year that I taught sixth grade at Rayther Elementary School in Ionia, Michigan, 29 bodies walked into a classroom that was much too small for us. We were a poor district at that time. and We didn't have all the supplies that we needed. We were pretty much making do with what we had. And out of the 29 students that came that year, 19 of them were boys. So there was a lot of testosterone energy in my classroom. And for the first time in my teaching career, there was a lot of fights breaking out that I had to split up and I didn't like it. Now, before they knew me very well, the beginning of the year, a small group of students came up to my desk. They had their spokesperson with them. His name was Ryan. And they were hanging off of his shoulder behind him saying things like, go on, tell her. You go on, say it. In all his boldness, but not very bigness, Ryan stepped up to my desk and said, 
we just came here to tell you that we don't like to read and we don't like to write and we want to know what you're going to do about that. <laughs> so I saw those words come tumbling across my desk and I could have taken them as disrespectful. I could have taken those words as rude, but I didn't. I knew that in their own 12 and 13 year old way, it was a call for help. And so I thought about what they said that night. I thought, what am I gonna do? It's my job to help them fall in love with language and fall in love with books and reading and ideas. What am I gonna do? And the next morning after attendance and lunch count, I looked out at that group of sixth graders and very mildly I said, I'm gonna tell you a story. Now, Ryan from the back of the classroom raised his hand and said, Mrs. Strauss, should we go down to the first grade and get our carpet squares? I said, no, Ryan, it's not going to be a first grade story. It's going to be a sixth grade story, and I think you're going to like it. Now, that morning, I chose a mystery because that afternoon in language, we were starting a unit and we were going to read and study and write mysteries. And so that morning, I made sure that the mystery I chose yes indeed was a blood and guts buried alive prison story and it was a mystery i saw a transformation happen in my classroom when i started to tell that story a classroom that usually had so much chaos and talking that they were never looking at me or listening at the same time all of a sudden everything calmed down and as i got further into the story i saw kids say leave me alone i want to hear this and then i saw shoulders drop and I saw heads move forward. And I saw them react at critical points in the mystery. Oh, oh. And I looked over and my buddy Ryan was so lost in that story that he didn't even know he was drooling. Now I knew I had them, but I didn't know why. I just knew that it was working. And every morning after that, I told a story and they loved this because for the first 20 minutes of the day, all they had to do was, yep, all they had to do was listen. Well, I made sure that every story that I told in the morning was connected somehow to everything else that we were gonna be studying or learning later in the day. And you know what? Story magic happened because they started to wait and see when that story was gonna connect with something else that we were gonna talk about later in the day. I did this for a half a year and it was on a cold February morning. I got to school early to get some work done and I thought I was the only other teacher in the building except for two others. I saw their cars in the parking lot when all of a sudden there was a knock at my classroom door. I thought it was another teacher, but when I opened the door on that cold morning, an hour before the bell, there was a small group of my students and I think you know who was with them. Ryan was with them. I looked down and I said, what are you doing here? It's an hour before school and it's freezing cold out. Ryan looked up and said, Mrs. Strauss, you know, we've been talking to each other a lot because we like to do that. I said, I know. What have you been talking about? We've been talking about those stories that you've been telling every morning. I said, this is a good thing. What about them? Ryan said, well, we came here to ask you a question. Go ahead. Can we do it? Seeing that I was looking down at a group of 12 and 13 year olds, I said, do what? Ryan said, can we tell stories? I said, you guys got to school an hour before the bell was gonna ring on a freezing cold morning to ask me if you could be a storyteller? Here's what Ryan said. Yeah, Mrs. Strauss, we've been listening to you all year and we're kind of sick of that and we wanna know if we can do it. If you knew Ryan the way we all did, you would have loved him just as much as we did. He just didn't have a filter on his mouth. I said, yes, we can do this. That afternoon when we got to language, I told them that we were gonna stop what we were doing in language for three weeks. Ryan let me know that that was the best idea that I had all year. I said, you have to go home. You have to find the children's book that you loved when you were four or five years old. I want you to bring it in, and if you don't have it any longer at home, write the title down, and we'll go to the library, and we'll find those favorite books. Well, the next day, they came in with either the books in their hands, or we went to the library to find the ones that they no longer had. And for three weeks, all they did was absorb and immerse themselves in that story, one that they had loved when they were young. The story that they would hold up to some big person in their life and they would say, will you read this to me? And if we loved them enough, we would read that book to them over and over again. Well, they learned those stories. In fact, one day my student Lori 
who had The Snowy Day by Ezra Jack Keats, put that book down on her desk and she said, I know this story so well, I don't need the book anymore. I'm gonna tell it from my heart. And she challenged every student in my classroom to start telling those stories instead of reading them out of the book. Magic happened again. The day that we told those stories, I took them down to Carpet Square Central, right? I took them down to the first grade classroom because I wanted them to have an audience that would appreciate their stories. And they stood up in front of those little ones and they told those stories and those little ones looked up with big eyes and loved every single one of them. And when we got back to the classroom after that, the next day I said, you guys, we can't stop with children's books. You have to start telling and writing stories about all the things that have ever happened to you in your life. Well, at first they said, no, they didn't wanna do that. But the next day when they came in, we met in a community circle. We met in that circle every day after that in the morning and right before we left when the day was over. And I had a great big basket on my lap that first day. And I said, I know you don't wanna do this. So we're not gonna write anything for a while. All we're gonna do is tell our stories out loud. The first day I pulled a slip up out of that basket and all it said was, who remembers the day you lost a tooth? And the first three hands that shot up, I said, tell us about it. Go ahead and tell us about it. Tell us what happened that day. And they told those stories. The next day, I asked them if they had remembered riding a two-wheel bike for the first time. And then stories about pets, getting them and losing them, babies born in the family, losing people that we loved. By the end of that year, because they had told their stories so many times, they weren't afraid of writing them down any longer. In fact, we were telling stories, we were reading to get more information before we wrote, and they were writing. At the end of the year, in our final community circle, I told them that I had been so inspired by what had happened in the classroom that year. Because not only were we reading and writing and telling stories, the bigger thing that happened that year was that the stories that we told in that group of teenagers connected them to each other. Because of the stories that they were willing to share from their lives, they realized that they were incredibly unique by the experiences that they had had and they were not alone in how they felt about the way that life was unfolding. So there was this incredible bonding that happened in the classroom that year. They were the ones that launched me. <laughs> I quit my job that year and I formed my business Story Be Told so that I could take what happened in that classroom on the road and share that process with more teachers and more people who work with teenagers. So I'd like to tell that story because they really were my first teachers when it came to adolescence. Now that changed a little bit later. Um, and I'm gonna talk to you today about the research that came out of um, um, Dr. David Walsh and the Institute on Media and the Family. So when I became a storyteller, I connected with a group of other storytellers in Minnesota. One of them was also connected with the Institute on Media and the Family and had a relationship with Dr. Walsh. We started to work with the Institute and when Dr. Walsh wasn't available to go out and speak, he would hire one of us to deliver the information from his book called, and this is in your resources, on your outline, why do they act that way? A survival guide to the adolescent brain for you and your teen. So during those years when I was speaking for Dr. David Walsh, I learned about the brain science behind why they act that way. And you know what? It's not their fault. It's what's going on in their brain that really matters to teenagers and how they're responding to things in their world and the people in their world. So I wanna take you on a little bit of a tour today of the adolescent brain. And in order to do that, first of all, if any of you have been on other webinars with me, um, the webinars for the best story time practices in our younger audiences, you would have heard me talk about two growth spurts in the brain of a developing child. And the first growth spurt, of course, is from the womb to the um, five years of age. And I've talked to you and used these before about the nerve cells in their brains and the axon or the cable of each one of those nerve cells and then the branches on the end of every nerve cell in a child's brain reaching out to be connected to another nerve cell whenever they have experiences that would cause their brain to grow. So I just wanted to bring those back up again because the second biggest growth spurt in a child's life happens from puberty 
to about the age of now for boys, 28 years old before their brain is fully developed. About 20 years ago, we said that the brain was fully developed by the age of 20. That has changed and we have a feeling it has to do with the influence of media and screens on the development of um, um, adolescent brains. So I wanna take you on a tour and in order to do that, you need to put on your hard hat if you have one with you today, right? We're going into the teenage brain and that's kind of a scary place to go. So I always say you have to don your hard hat in order to go in there. So I hope you have your hard hat on. I'm gonna share my screen with you right now because I have some slides that will walk us through the parts of the teenage brain that will start helping us make sense of why they act that way. So let me share my screen with you and get the slides arranged so that you can see them. Hang on. All right, you ready to go in? We're heading in. So um, I, here's a, a slice off the side of a teenager's brain so we can look inside. Um, and I need to tell you that the development of a child's brain starts at the stem and the development or the maturation process goes from the back of the brain all the way up to the front. All right. So we have two growth spurts, one from womb to five, the second biggest growth spurt from puberty to about the age of 28. So that movement of development is going towards the front of the brain. You see that little red, red dot on the prefrontal cortex? I just wanna let you know that that's the last part of the adolescent brain to develop and I want you to keep that in mind. So here's that nerve cell I told you about. And when there's a growth spurt, like the one we're talking about, those branches or dendrites on the end of that nerve cell expand. There's about 10,000 of them on the end of every single nerve cell in the brain. So imagine 10,000 dendrites reaching out to connect with another nerve cell. But I also need to remind you that when those nerve cells connect, it is totally experience dependent. So if we want our teens to develop and grow to be well-balanced human beings when they become adults, we need to give them lots of rich and diverse experiences that will help them become responsible adults later. So that's one cell and those dendrites, which I want you to keep in mind is that they're reaching out and expanded during this growth spurt. So, so neuroscientists tell us that the neurons that fire together are the ones that wire together. And the neurons that are gonna wire together are the ones that are going to be stimulated by experiences that that child is going to be having. So we call that a blossoming process, but if that child doesn't have well-balanced experiences, then those nerve cells are not going to wire and fire together. And if they don't, then we call that a pruning sequence, which means that student or that child, that teen, doesn't get the opportunity to grow or develop in certain areas of their lives if they don't have that experience. So here's time lapse, and I want you to focus on the blue as we look at these brains from age five to age 20 and see that the blue or the development of that brain starts at the back of the brain, moves towards the front of the brain, and the last part of that brain to be fully developed is the prefrontal cortex. So this is our first construction stop on the tour of the adolescent brain, you guys, because the prefrontal cortex is also what we call the CEO of the brain, the control of the brain. That part of the brain is responsible for our ability to plan ahead, to think about consequences before we do something, to reflect on things that have already happened and maybe learn from that experience. The prefrontal cortex is responsible for impulse control and gives us the ability to stop, look, listen, and then make a choice, right? So because the prefrontal cortex is the last part of the adolescent brain to develop, we know that we've seen these things or these behaviors in teens. It means that they have trouble with certain things like impulse control, um, risk-taking behavior. At that time of their lives, they tend to get more disorganized. They're very distractible and even more so now because of screen time. There can be negative responses or negative emotions that weren't there before they reach puberty. 
and there's conflict seeking. So we may think that all of these things are negative for teenagers, but they're really not. It's not their fault. We have to consider what's going on in their brain. If you look at the little Calvin and Hobbes cartoon in the corner, he's saying, my problem is my lips move when I think. So it gives us a little bit of sense of humor there for what's going on for these teenagers. So let's go back now and look at their brain again and realize that their entire prefrontal cortex is under construction and there's yellow tape around it, which means that our job, being the people working with teenagers, is to be their surrogate CEO or their surrogate PFC, prefrontal cortex, during this time in their life. And it's not an easy thing to do. So the second stop on the construction tour, our second construction site is called the Acceleration Center. And if you can see our little pilot flying on that paper airplane is driving the Hormone Express. So this is the second thing that's going on. In the adolescent brain, there is the release of both hormones, 50 different hormones, and then neurotransmitters at a rate and a volume that's very different than before puberty. So we know this story pretty well that for boys who have entered adolescence, it's testosterone that is increased in their system. Once they reach puberty, there is 1,000 times more testosterone in their systems before that point. So keep that in mind. We know the girl's story is a little bit different for there are three hormones that are fluctuating at different paces and at different times. So estrogen, progesterone, and oxytocin. When estrogen is down, progesterone is up. Oxytocin kind of goes up and down in between those two hormones. Oxytocin is that cuddle hormone, right? But if it's fluctuating, you might have a teenage girl who is happy in the morning, having a meltdown in the afternoon because there's not enough milk and wants a hug before she goes to bed at night. So they're dealing with that. And then there's a, an increase in melatonin, which is why teenagers have such strange sleep patterns and can be sleeping until one in the afternoon and up all night playing video games. It's the melatonin surge in their body at that time. The other thing that's happening is um, an expression of neurotransmitters during adolescence, dopamine, which is a happy neurotransmitter, serotonin, which is a mood stabilizer, and then norepinephrine, which gives them the energy that we see in teenagers, and also the aggression, the aggression that we see in them. So keeping this in mind. This is a place where all of those hormones and all of those neurotransmitters are being produced. In the hypothalamus, in fact, the pituitary gland, which is this bigger picture that you see. But here's the thing. The place where all of those neurotransmitters and hormones are docking are here. You see those two little almond-shaped things on the end of the hypothalamus? That's called the amygdala. So the amygdala is that part of our brain where we receive the impulse of emotions, memories, motivation, and desire. So put this together and know that if the CEO is out to lunch and the testosterone, progesterone, estrogen, oxytocin, serotonin, epinephrine, and dopamine are all docking in the amygdala, which is where they dock, it is the 4th of July and the fireworks are happening in that part of their brain. The part of the brain that registers emotion, aggression, motivation, and desire. So does this start to make sense? What we have here is the gas pedal is to the floor of the race car and the brakes are no longer working. The other thing that happens, and we've all probably have had experiences with this, with the teens that come into the library or maybe your own teenagers, is that communication changes because their brains are on fire. They don't hear us during this time period the same way that they may have heard us before puberty. We might just turn to a teen and say, I need you to be quiet in the library. And they look back at you and say, why are you yelling at us? You're always yelling at us. It isn't that you're yelling, and it is how they are hearing you. It's because of what's happening in their brains that they're hearing it differently. So we need to figure out a different way to communicate with them, right? So here's what we're seeing. 
um, in the adult brain, we read emotions with our prefrontal cortex. Remember, theirs is not developed yet. In the adolescent brain, when they're trying to figure out what's going on with their friends and their parents and other people around them, they're reading all of those emotions with their amygdala. Gives us a little bit more insight, doesn't it? So what do we do? We have to surround them right? We have to be their support. We have to be there to support them and connect with them and communicate. So here's some spheres of influence that might affect a teenager, their family, of course, the community, which is where we come in, and society, the bigger level of society, which family and community can help them navigate, right? So what do they really need? We know this. They need connection. They need guidance. And they need a lot of love. And sometimes that's hard to do, right? But we got to know it's not their fault. It's what's happening in their brain. They need connection with us. And we cannot grant them the divorce that it looks like they're asking us for. That separation and leave me alone, that isn't what they really need. We have to redefine how we connect with teenagers. It's got to look a little bit differently than it did before they reached puberty. It's important to kind of have a grasp on who their friends are, who are the groups of friends that are hanging out at the library, or who are they bringing with them. We have to keep and be consistent with certain rituals, even if it's the time that we hold our team programs in the libraries. And we have to be there and hang out just to listen. Be there to listen. We have to maintain open lines of communication, even though we might not be happy with the way that they communicate back to us all the time. They need guidance. They need caring adults who are going to be that surrogate prefrontal cortex for them until theirs develops. They need consistency and limits and consequences if things aren't going well. They need to trust us, but they need to know the reasons why they trust us, and we need to trust them. And we have to avoid power struggles because all they do is escalate, and we know that. And it's really hard if you get triggered as an adult and your prefrontal cortex goes out to lunch, it's easy to get into a power struggle, but that's not gonna help at all for the way that they are hearing communication and perceiving communication. They need love. Being with teenagers is a um, long-term investment. It's a delayed gratification event, <laughs> but Raising, teaching, and guiding teens, it isn't a problem that we have to solve. We don't have to solve their problems. It's an adventure to be lived, and hopefully we have the courage to live it with them, right? So here's a serenity prayer for any of you that need it right now in these times, but also in your work with teens. Grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. So I bring Coyote into this picture at this point because uh, my work with teenagers has grown immensely over the last 10 years. Um, not only am I going into middle schools to teach uh, storytelling to story writing workshops, I have also engaged with a number of alternative high schools across the state trying to help youth at risk change their story, see their story in a little bit of a different way and change their story. Um, I am now working with um, uh, District Court 19 in Manistee and Benzie County, our youth at risk, doing the same, trying to be that consistent adult who supports them, that they can trust, and helping them to change their story. So I often bring traditional stories into the picture, and this is one about Coyote. So um, this story has served me well with a lot of populations, especially teenagers. I've been telling this story a lot to my college students at the beginning of the semester so that they can make better choices. So we know Coyote as a trickster in so many traditional stories. He's also a joker and very much likes to make fun of himself and make fun of others. So he's a great teacher for these teenagers. He's a magician, which they all are as well. He has many gifts and skills and can be a shapeshifter, can change his mood and can change who he is on any given day. Sound familiar? And Coyote ultimately is the wise teacher. And I tell this story so that teenagers can understand that they too are the wise one, the magician, the joker, and the trickster. So I'd like to tell you this story. A young person woke up in the middle of the night. They woke up because they heard the song of a bird called a whippoorwill. 
Oh, they had heard the Whipple Will before, but they had never seen one singing. And that was something that they always wanted. They had a great desire for that. And so that night they got up, put on their clothes and went out in search of the Whipple Will. Now there was some moonlight so they could see pretty well, but the song of the Whipple Will was so clear. It carried on the wind. It sounded much closer than it really was. The young person traveled across the field following the sound of that bird when they found a trail in that field and it was headed in the right direction. So they thought that walking that trail would be an easier way to cross the field to get to what they wanted. Along the trail, they looked up at one point and saw Coyote sitting in the middle of that trail. At first, that young person wanted to turn and run for they were afraid of Coyote, but then they were too afraid to run. And so they turned and faced Coyote who lifted his nose, looked at the young person and said, why are you out here tonight? Why are you following me? The young person put their head down trying to figure out what to do. They thought if they told Coyote, that wouldn't be a good thing. But if they didn't tell Coyote, that wouldn't be a good thing either. And finally they blurted out, I'm not following you, Coyote. Coyote said, well, you're not following me. What are you doing out here in the middle of the night? The young person said, oh, Coyote, I woke up to the beautiful song of the Whippoorwill and I just wanted to see them singing for the first time. Coyote said, don't you like my songs? I sing really well. The young person said, oh, Coyote, I've heard you all my life. I know your songs. I wanted to see the Whippoorwill because that's something I have never experienced before. Coyote got jealous. He said, listen to my night song. And he picked his nose up and yodeled out a tune that made the young person cover their ears. They said, thanks for the song, Coyote, but I better be going. If I don't hurry, I'm gonna miss my chance. Coyote was so jealous, he was seething. And he said, all right, if you don't wanna listen to me sing, I know a shortcut to where the whippoorwill is singing. It's right over here. And he pointed his claw. The young person looked up and saw that the night was passing quickly. And if they didn't hurry, they were gonna miss their chance altogether. And so then that split second, they made a choice to follow Coyote. Coyote headed off at a full trot and not on any trail at all. The young person was struggling to keep up. At one point, Coyote turned around and said, what's the matter with you? Is there something wrong with you? Why can't you keep up? And he headed off again. The young person tried to catch up, but they fell and busted up a knee in a gopher hole. And by the time they arrived in the field where the whippoorwill had been singing all night, it was morning. The whippoorwill was gone, and the young person realized they had missed their chance altogether. Coyote was yodeling out a tune in another field, and the young person turned and headed for home covered in mosquito bites and burrs and one skinned up knee. But it was many years later when they realized what really happened that night. There are many paths that you can take in this life to get to something that you really want. You have to stay true to your own path and you have to keep your eye out for coyote. So the truth in that story resonates with me as I work with the teenagers in my life that there are many paths and there are many choices and they have to learn how to be confident enough to make those choices that are good for them. And so that we talk about the coyotes that are in the teenage brain and we talk about how they can somehow resist or work with the adults in their life or work with other in other ways to resist so that the coyotes that are in their brain do not cause them to make bad choices that will take their future and, and make that look less appealing. So one of the coyotes in their brain is self-esteem and because of that lack of self-esteem then peer pressure becomes a coyote. One of the coyotes in their brains is media and advertising. And you can be sure that the advertising industry knows how to sell to teenagers because if they can convince them to buy a product or need a product, they're gonna have a lifelong customer. So media and advertising is a coyote in their brain thinking they're not okay the way they are and they need something that they're gonna purchase or gain from out there that's gonna make them whole and okay. Seeking pleasure and excitement because they're bored 
this is a huge problem right now. It's okay to learn how to be bored if you have the ability to creatively solve your problems. But that's a coyote in the brains of teenagers today. Boredom is a big issue. And then finally, drugs and alcohol is a coyote in the teenage brain because that amygdala that we talked about earlier that was the docking station for neurotransmitters and hormones is also the docking station for drugs and alcohol. And because that part of their brain is wide open, they don't feel the effects of drugs and alcohol as quickly and oftentimes can find themselves in big trouble with addiction or overdose. So those are some of the coyotes in the teenage brain. So Dr. David Walsh, in his book, Whoever Tells, or oh, Why Do They Act That Way, says, whoever tells a story defines the culture. We don't want to give the storytellers role solely up to digital media. And if we're going to engage with teens, then we can do that in our libraries and we can engage with them in ways that will help them know that we are the supportive person that's going to be their um, surrogate CEO and be there in a consistent way to listen and be involved in their lives and give them diverse amount of experiences that will help them develop their brains. So I when I first was asked to do this webinar, I realized that I have been in libraries for 30 years doing my own storytelling and writing programs, summer reading programs, but I wasn't on the inside or in the trenches. So I went to our library, the Traverse Area District Library, and I interviewed Linda Smith, who I believe is on the call today. She may still be on. Linda, I'm sorry about the picture I grabbed was pixelated. She's really much more beautiful than this picture that you're seeing on your screen. And Linda gave me permission to give her um, contact information so that if you wanted to get a hold of her, you could talk with her more about some of the ideas she shared with me in the interview that I had with her. So I'd like to talk about some of the things I learned by talking to Linda, who is the team coordinator at Tattle and has had years of experiences with teenagers. And I was ever so delighted and impressed when I spoke with her that day. So let me share with you some of the questions I asked and some of the things that Linda shared back with me. So the first thing I asked her was, was there a teen advisory group there at Tattle? And the first thing that Linda told me was that it was like shifting sands, <laughs> that it was an ever changing group, but that she knew that she had to be the one that remained consistent and always there to offer, even though the group was changing. She explained a time where there had started off um, with just two students, and by asking them to bring their friends to the library, it grew to a group of 15. Um, they were with her in a, in a teen group for a few years until they graduated from high school. And then that group left and she was left with two students again. And they were a lot younger than the ones that had just graduated and moved on. So it was a starting over process. When I asked her what was the most important thing about staying consistent with a teen group in the library, she said availability being there at the same time every week, no matter how many teens came in. So being available to hang out, to chat, to get to know them and to listen. She said the connection was important, making that connection with them and that it's not a forced connection, but it's one that's made consistently over time, thus the availability. Um, to be there to give them the information that they're seeking or the information that they need. So that part of being a librarian, that's always been true. To not be their friend, she said, but to offer guidance and mentorship. They need those, those mentors in their lives to show them the right and wrong way to act since their PFC is not working. And then to have um, decent snacks. I love this. To always have decent snacks available. Now, we always said that if you feed them, they will come. That's not always true, but it sure does help. And so decent snacks was big on the list. I went into the space. In fact, we met in the space um, at the Woodmere branch of Traverse Area District Library that is dedicated to teens. And I started to look around and I asked um, Linda about the space there. And what became very clear is that space wasn't hers, it was theirs. And that they had a part in forming how the furniture was arranged, the artwork that was on the walls, and some of it had been generated by those teens. Um, the computer banks were actually made, the hard drives were actually made by the teen group. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and that, uh, that, they, that space was theirs, so that they could own that space, 
learn how to respect that space in the library and also share, learn how to share that public space with everybody else using the other parts of the library. So appropriate behavior. Um, the group that she had originally had were called the Teen Sages. The new group that formed decided they wanted to rebrand themselves. They came up with a new name. Um, their name is the FBI, the Fabulous Beautiful Individuals. And they worked on a logo that was sort of a knockoff from the FBI badge and marketing and branding themselves as a group. So that all had to do with that space that we were in that day. And it really felt like it was their space. And, and I loved being in it and seeing everything that was up on the walls and all the messages and the shared space where messaging could happen for teens who came in. Really beautiful space. Um, my next question to Linda was about connecting with the teachers or anybody at the schools that could help promote the team program at the library, right? So I often hear as I talk to librarians around the state that they sometimes don't have a direct connection with somebody at the schools which kind of blows my mind, you guys, but I understand why it happens. The people and the teachers and everybody in the schools are sort of buried in their own isolated workload, right? And they're doing their own thing within and it's really hard to reach out when you're in that situation. We all know how that feels. But Linda said there were a few key people, a few key teachers in the middle schools and in the high schools that she could go to. And they would let her visit their classrooms um, to talk about summer reading, to do book talks, to drop off information about teen events so she could advertise there, they would get the word out. Um, she also talked about how they were helping promote those events and sending teens her way. So um, collaborating with anybody inside the schools that will help you and get that word out to the teens that they are teaching to come to the library and engage with all the wonderful events that you're offering is really a key thing. Um, another really beautiful collaboration that I was excited about, Linda told me that she had collaborated with our alternative high school here in Traverse City. It's called Traverse City High School. And I've worked there with those students as well. Um, she went there because they were the perfect audience to do a great stories club. And I'll talk about this resource in just a second. So um, collaborating where you can with the group that you can and with staff members on the insides of the schools who would most help you build that teen group at your library and be a good support for you. Um, let's see. Oh, and the partnership with homeschool groups. I'm sure that you've all seen that in your libraries. Homeschoolers are notorious for using the libraries well. And so homeschool groups and homeschool parents are another great support for the teen programs at your libraries. Um, we next talked about events. And how do you offer events at the library? And how did you decide what events they're gonna like? Of course, you're gonna survey your teens and ask them what they wanna be engaged with. What impressed me about talking with Linda about how she planned events at their library was that she so often collaborates with community partners who can provide a new skill for the teens, supplies so that your budget isn't always tapped out, some expertise in a certain area that would interest those teens, and then the experience of time, the gift of time that they would give to them. So there were many um, events that I'll talk about next that were dependent on a community partner. We're really lucky here in Traverse City. Um, we're a small, big town. Um, and so there's a lot of networking that happens here and a lot of talent in our community, but I can't believe that every community doesn't have talented people with expertise who might be interested in sharing their expertise and time and supplies with teens who are interested in learning new skills and need it for their own brain development. Um, we talked a lot about thinking outside of the box when it came to programming. I added a few ideas, but some of the things that Linda was doing with her teens were cooking experiences, sewing experiences, building things, growing gardens and then cooking from the gardens, clock making, building computers, as I mentioned earlier, going on adventures in the community, providing community service for seniors and other aspects of the community. Um, theatrical venues, which we have many of, collaborating with those here in Traverse City. Um, college instructors and professors at our community college. And I thought about some others that are here that would be great community collaborators, which is our local radio stations, our local cable TV station, 
would be another great experience for teens to learn skills and expertise from those in our community who would offer that to them. Um, teens in the library under Linda's, under Linda's um, direction are learning about local issues. They're learning how to be of service to the community and learning how to be in that bigger sphere, you know, that we talked about, these spheres of influence in their lives, learning how to be someone who can affect change in their own community and the world at large. So some of the events that um, they were doing there at Tattle, I wanna talk about a few of those because some of them are attached to some of the resources that I placed on your outline that are out there and available for you so that you have support and resources for it that you can bring back to your library so you can engage. Um, the biggest event, Linda said, at Tattle, Woodmere Branch is the National Teen Lock-In. And so there's a site that I gave you the website for on your resources for the National Teen Lock-In site. Um, it happens on July 31st. You apply to get all the resources. They offer you incredible supports. So um, some of the things they offer are um, the author talks that happen during the whole night. Um, I'm trying to look at my, my, my list here because I'm forgetting some of those, Linda. Um, they offer, um, let's see, I'm sorry, you guys, I'm, I lost my place here. So what happened with this lock-in is that Linda gives up the planning with her direction, of course, and parameters of the whole event to the teen group. So that means planning the schedule, deciding on what the rules are, planning the entire event from activities to food to planning the budget and then marketing the event. So again, giving those teens the life skills they'll need later by planning an event that's theirs at the library. The Great Stories program I talked about earlier, again, um, there's a website in your resources where you can go and apply for a grant. Um, they offer training program. It's theme related materials for teens that are very powerful and pertinent to our time. Um, she did a clock building uh, event with, um, someone here in our community that was a clock builder, but um, ordered the kits, very um, inexpensive kits online. They did build, birdhouse building with a carpenter here in town, the computer building I talked about. Um, she talked about having book talks, but informally, and those book talks happened around a craft table, so those teens were involved in a craft while they were also doing a book talk. They did a puppet theater and a pajama party for the youngest patrons in the library. And those were high schoolers who were very interested in daycare and early childhood for their futures. So they did that. And then the last thing that we talked about that I thought was incredibly important because there's so many food insecure people in our community is that they did a program called Meet Up and Eat Up, addressing food insecurity um, and community partners provided the snacks. So lots of different ways to engage. Finally, the last things that Linda shared with me that kind of touched my heart when it comes to our teen audience were these tips for anyone working with teens at the library. Be a consistent, consistent and trusted mentor and a guide. Lead by teaching instead of preaching and scolding. Provide activities that teach valuable life skills. Let go of control so that teens can own the program. It may not be perfect, but it will be theirs. Provide opportunities to promote buy-in. Let them choose their activities and give them good, strong parameters. And finally, the most powerful one was let every day be a new day and a new chance for the teens who come into your library. So I thank you, Linda Smith, for that interview. You have all of this in your handouts, all the feedback that Linda gave me when I interviewed her in your handouts, so you can refer back to those, okay? Thank you, Linda. All right, so in my own programs in your libraries over the last 30 years, these are some of the things that I've offered. And I wanna end our webinar today by sharing some of these ready to go activities with you. Um, I have offered a story improv theater workshops, story slams moth style with friendly competition and prizes, a workshop called writing outside of the lines for those teens in your library who love to write and can't get enough of it. Um, this summer, Urban Legends workshop, so um, for Imagine Your Story 2020, I'm doing a lot of those this summer and getting those teens involved in exploring the urban legends and telling the urban legends from their own areas.
Um, I have a writing model called Turning Points Personal Narrative Model for the more serious writers. I do story arts workshops where we tell a story, act a story out, and that's followed up with an art project. Um, I do summer reading theme-based programs. Last year, I didn't do storytelling as much as I did rocket launching labs all summer long with teenagers across the state. And finally, for youth at risk, keeping an eye out for coyote, change your story and change your life. So I'm gonna come back to the screen now and show you some icebreakers for as much time as we still have left. Kathy gave me permission to go a little bit longer today. So I'm gonna take the 15 minutes that she's offered me <coughs> to show you as many activities as I can from the, group of, um, from the group of workshops I just showed you, okay? So let's come back, hard hat off. How's everybody doing? I haven't been checking the chat box, Kathy, so maybe you can tell me if there's any questions at this point. No questions yet, but people can feel free to comment. And I am recording this webinar. If you have to leave at three o'clock, um, we can certainly do that. Um, and then uh, Aaron wanted a chance to maybe talk about the National Teen Lock-In because she is the co-chair for that. Oh, do we want to do that so, right now? I'd be happy. Sure, I have to <laughs> unmute her unmute here. Unmute Aaron, please. Yeah, hold on. Do, 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 do. Aaron, go for it. Awesome, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay, I apologize for background noise. My uh, 3D printer is going <laughs> off in the background, so um, that's what you are hearing. Um, so I am the co-chair of the National Teen Lock, and I have been for the last, uh, I think, four years. Um, you guys are going to get some exclusive um, information about uh, this because we haven't announced it, but we do have um, three confirmed authors for our author chats, which we do live. Oh, thank you. There's our wiki. Um, and I can uh, tell you guys who they are. Um, so, live from the Jackson District Library, which is where my other co-chair uh, is located, we're going to have Sadie Francis Skyheart um, do a chat with us. Um, and she is a um, lesser known author. We always like to do somebody that's more like up and coming or somebody a little more obscure. And um, then we also have um, Malaka Garib. She wrote the graphic novel, I Was Your American Dream that came out last year. It's amazing, she works for NPR. It's actually um, a memoir. So um, she's gonna be talking to us about that, about how to create a graphic novel and um, about how writing, how, you know, writing a memoir in graphic novel format. Um, and then we also have, I'm very excited about this, um, Adib Karim who wrote Darius the Great is Not Okay which I'm obsessed with that book. Um, the sequel is coming out this summer. Um, if you haven't read it, I definitely recommend it. Um, and then we are waiting to hear back about for three more authors. Um, I think uh, one, of, one or two of them will definitely say yes. Um, but I will be, actually be posting more documents today. Um, so up right now are the permission slips. If uh, you guys need to use that for your lock-in, um, we post, uh, it will be under our registration resources page, yeah. And um, there's permission slips, there's a flyer that I've created, there's um, an icebreaker that you can do. The icebreaker is actually to find out what your name would be. Um, so that's, that's what I made, um, it's editable, um, and you guys can write your own information in there. Uh, there are logos. Uh, some people like to do shirts or other um, things with the logo on it, and you guys are definitely free to use it. I, I create all the logos in um, paint. So by creation, I give you guys full permission to use anything. Um, and then um, we have uh, our crafts ready that are, will be posted, our minute to win it ready, our photo scavenger hunt clues were ready. Um, uh, we were going to be working on our escape room, and we'll post that when that's done. And um, our online connections form is ready. If you, after you register, um, you can fill out online connections, and we can match you with another library that you can chat with virtually, um, you know, through Skype or whatever else you want to use. 
Oh, Jody said, I love Darius. I'm so glad. I'm glad that somebody else loves that too. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, what else can I tell you? Um, um, I'm just really excited about it. If yeah, anybody yeah. has any questions, feel free to email me. We do have an email that is nationalteamlockin at gmail.com. However, I will admit that I'm not the best at um, checking it all the time. We also have a Facebook page, which um, I post on also. So, yep, it's Thank right you. on the website there. Thanks. Thank you, Erin. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thanks, Erin. What a great program. Thanks for all the work you do for that. That's really amazing. So speaking of icebreakers, I'm going to share a few with you right now at the end of this time. And again, it is three o'clock right now. If you need to go, that's fine. This is recorded. Um, I'll share as many as I can in these 15 minutes. So, um, you know, when teens come into the library, they often feel awkward or um, they need some way to connect or they might be feeling a little shy or that self-confidence isn't all there. So there's a, a lot of things that we can do as icebreakers. Um, and so one of the things that I can't believe this still works. We did it at camp when I was a kid with every group of teenagers. It breaks the ice. They start giggling and laughing and their personalities come out without asking them to do very much. And it's called, this is a stick. So um, as part of that workshop, when we do these, I have them make their own talking sticks so that they know the power of their voice, the power of their words, and the power of their stories to change the world. So we actually make these after we do this activity. Um, and they decorate them, you know, with letters and feathers and bells and beads and um, hemp and whatever you have on hand. What these are are door shims that you buy at the hardware store, 25, no, 24 in a pack for I think under $3. And there's a lot of surface area that they can use to decorate. Plus it's a story stick. And the tradition of this, the talking stick is that whoever holds the talking stick has the voice and everybody else has to listen and give the respect to listen to that person. So it's a great thing to use if you're trying to make decisions or you're working in a group and you want everybody to be heard, they can hold their talking stick when it's their turn to talk, right? So this is how this works. And it's gonna be really weird to show it to you because I don't have anybody here to do it with, but in your packet is the chapter from my book telling stories about how to use the talking stick in many different ice breaking ways. Here's how it begins. The person who holds a stick in the circle is going to turn to the person next to them and they're going to say, this is a stick. The person they're handing it to is going to say, a what? They will repeat, this is a stick. The person they're talking to says, oh, it's a stick and they hand it to them, which then that person turns to the next person in the circle and does the same thing. This is a stick. A what? A stick. Oh, a stick. Believe it or not, by the time it goes around this circle, they are adding voices, personality, attitude, you name it. And for some reason, because you're focusing on such a simple activity, this is a stick, all of a sudden, it breaks the ice. Now, I change it up a little bit. So the second time around, emotion, right, amygdala, they have to add an emotion. And whenever the, they pass it along, the person they pass the stick to has to copy that emotion, like this. <laughs> this is a stick. <laughs> a what? A <laughs> stick. Oh, it's a stick. Right, but the next person might do it in robot style. This is a stick. A what? A stick. Oh, a stick. And it goes all the way the circle that way. The third time around to break the ice, I have them use the stick to imitate something that they do every day. Right? All the way around the circle. So it's a really fun icebreaker. There's tons of ideas in your packet for how to use the talking stick activity for uh, icebreakers and then decorating them so they can take that home. It can be a bookmark, but it also is a reminder of how important their voices are and how much they need to be heard and listened to and how their stories can change the world. So talking sticks, first icebreaker. Second one on your list, actually it's the third one, but I skipped the purple cloth because that one isn't as, um, isn't as important as the other ones. Band-Aid story. 
So when I'm doing um, the story slams and getting them ready to tell a story, well, those story slams in the summer reading workshops, it's usually a five minute story. Um, and so I also want them to know that they all have stories and that they're easy to access. So everybody has had a time when they needed a Band-Aid. And we all know this to be true. So I asked them to imagine a time when they were younger, or maybe not so young, when they needed a Band-Aid. And I asked them to remember where they were, what they were wearing, what they were doing that day. Was there anybody else there with them? I asked them to remember how the accident happened, the ouch part of the story. Did anybody come to help them? And then what did they learn? So there's a memoirian piece to this. So let me show you how I get them ready for this. And um, there's a slide, but Kath, I don't know that I'm going to go back to that screen. I think I'll just show you. And Kathy's going to do this with me. And then when you get to your slides, which are part of your handouts, you'll see um, the hand and the questions around that hand. It's also in your packet, right? So I have them interview each other after they imagine this time when they needed a Band-Aid. I have them sit across from another team, six feet apart. I'm sorry, I couldn't help it. Okay, so they have their hand up or they'll have the hand out in front of them because they always say, I don't remember. But there's six questions that they're gonna ask their partner to get this story out of their partner. Now, Kathy, before I have you do it, I just wanna show everybody what the questions are. And I do this with the teens too. They point to the middle of their hand and they say, when did this happen? And I have them say it back to me. When did this happen? To lead into the story, they use their thumb and I say, where were you? So place and setting, right? Where were you? Next finger, getting deeper into the story. What were you doing? What were you doing? Middle of the story is often where the action happens. Not always, of course, but often. And I say, what happened? What happened? They talk about that. And then getting towards the end of the story, and the meaning of the story, who helped you, even if it was no one, right? Who helped you, even if it was no one? And finally, the memoir finger on both sides. How did you feel and what did you learn? So let's do them again. And then, Kath, I'm going to ask you these questions, and you're going to try and okay. think of the parts of a story. And I prepped her earlier, so I hope you have a Band-Aid story. I do. Some about falling through a floor, I think, right? Mm -hmm. So, okay, so do it again, it's when did this happen? When did this happen? Where were you? Where were you? What were you doing? What were you doing? What happened? What happened? Who helped? Who helped? How did you feel? How did you feel? What did you learn? What did you learn? So for them, any story they're ever going to write the rest of their life is going to have these six parts in some format, right? Any personal narrative. So Kathy, are you ready? I think so. I didn't I'm know the questions. I didn't know the I'll, questions I'll, I'll ahead of time. You them. Okay. I'll ask you them. Okay. So this helps in the beginning <laughs> with the icebreaker because to get them to come up with a story right away, it's really hard. And if they're shy, oh, that's even worse, right? So by asking each other these questions, it gives them permission to listen permission to, for the other person to tell the story in parts, right? And start getting used to the flow of things. Are you ready, Kath? I'm ready. When did this happen? I was about nine. Okay, and where were you that day? Uh, I was at our family cottage on Round Island in upstate New York. Okay, and what were you doing? my sister and I were walking to the post office. It was an island post office. So the post office is over a dock. It is over a dock? Yeah. Oh, it's wow. like so built on top of the dock. On top of the dock and the water's mm -hmm. all around? Yep, okay. and under. <laughs> so part, here comes the Band-Aid part. What happened that day? Um, the floor was rotting and I walked in and there was a little hole and I my little skinny foot went right through and I went up to my knee and was dangling over the water through the post office floor. Oh my God. <laughs> so who helped you? That's terrible. Who helped you? Uh, my sister uh, helped pull me up. She was probably about seven. And then we walked um, down we were heading back to the cottage and I was crying and emotional oh. and this little 
woman we called Grandma Brown, she was like the island grandma, um, came out and stopped me and bandaged me up. Oh, how sweet. Yeah. Oh, okay, so how did you feel that day? I felt very loved and also a little bit of a, like a star because I was always known as the girl who fell through the post office floor. <laughs> they still talk about it today. <laughs> You're a legend. What did you learn that day, Kath? What did I learn? Yeah, what did you learn? Um, to always look before I step, <laughs> especially <Awesome>. over water. <laughs> So we show appreciations for our partner and then you switch places. So then Kathy would then interview me and I would show a Band-Aid story. And if you go a little bit further with this, I do this, you know how you do like um, meet up in a circle, fast date meet, you know what I'm talking about where you have five minutes and then you move to the next person and you have five minutes. You get an outer circle and an inner circle after they get their details and they have to tell it and tell it and tell it again. And if they are motivated, they might wanna write it down. If not, the storytelling experience icebreaker is enough to help them understand. One, they're very unique in their experiences. And two, they all are connected in how they feel about things in this life that happened to them. And it's just a really wonderful, simple um, thing. I often go to things in their lives that everybody has common experience with. So that's the Band-Aid story and the guidelines and the hand stuff and everything is in your handouts. So you can access that a little bit later. So I'm gonna do one more and that'll probably take us right to uh, the end of our, our uh, 15 minutes extra. So thanks Kath for the extra time. I have so much more that I wanted to share. So um, I'm gonna do the prompts one because that is in your handout and um, we'll have to save the other ones for later, either another webinar or Kathy and I, you and I can talk. If I offer my own webinar and you could get the information out to everybody who was on this one, I would be willing to, on my own, do more icebreaker teen activities as an extension of this. So sure. we can talk about that later. Okay, that. in your handout, there's a list of prompts, very much like the ones that I've been talking about, that sort of lets them understand that they are unique, but they also have similar experiences. They're not alone. They are not isolated. They are not the only one who feels that way. So you have a prompt list there that you can work off of if you want to. But what I love to do is to take all the prompts on that list and put them on strips like these. Like this one says, a haircut or a hairstyle story. Um, so the list, uh, all the prompts that are on your list, I put them on strips like this, and then I lay them out on the table where we might be snacking or sitting or getting ready to do something else, or this is the activity icebreaker for that night. I lay them all out and I say, I want you to pick one that you like or one that you gravitate to, and they grab that. And then it's the same thing where they sit with a partner and tell the story of what came to mind for them from that story prompt. And you guys, you can use the hand again. Instead of um, who helped you, it would be who was there with you, right? So the characters, the setting, the timing, and what happened, the action, um, how did you feel and what did you learn by that happening? So I love using story prompts, all different choices, so they can choose what they want and then share that story. You can do it with a story stick around the group, or you can do this by letting them talk to partners. I find the most power with teen groups is when everybody hears everybody else's story, always with the option to pass if they're not comfortable, right? If they're not ready yet, but always encouraging them to join in and be listened to and feel that audience feeling of being listened to, right? So story prompts, all right, as the last icebreaker. It's a really good one. So let's see here. Let me see where we're at. We were right there. So thank you everyone for um, attending the webinar. I hope there was some new information for you today that is helpful, especially understanding what's going on inside that teenage brain when we feel frustrated with them. Know that it's not their fault. It's all that's happening inside of their brain during the second biggest growth spurt of their life. And maybe that'll help us be more compassionate and more caring and be that person who is gonna show up with consistency and love and guidance and connection. 
So um, thank you. You guys take good care of yourselves, please, during this extraordinarily weird and uncertain time. Try and stay hopeful. It's my belief that something bigger and greater is going to come out of all of this. For we are always at our best when things are at extremes. It's sort of when we shine our brightest. So I hope you'll all take really good care of yourselves and each other. And we'll see you again. Kathy, thank you so much. And thank you, Jen. Really appreciate all the time you give us and all the wonderful stories. Um, you probably didn't see in our chat, but we were all getting a bit choked up today. <laughs> I didn't see the chat. <laughs> me especially, I don't know. Um, so just a reminder to everyone to please fill out the surveys. Um, I just, it's real quick. You can see here, it's only like seven questions long. Um, it'll help Jennifer and I plan for next year, um, to continue this series. And then also to fill out those, um, or I already asked you to fill out survey, but to take a look at those handouts and a big thanks to Institute of Museum and Library Services and to Jennifer Strauss here today. Thank you, everybody. Have a good one. Be safe. And I hope to see you online yeah. uh, Thursday. So.